Uh, well, comments. A hundred years ago, this spring, the Comintern was founded. Uh, it was launched in the middle of the Russian Revolution, and it was launched as the international that was going to bury capitalism and imperialism forever. Now, a lot of people. How many of you think a hundred years is a long time? Really? Well, by some measures, it may be a long time, but there are people alive today who were 15 or 16 years old when the Comintern was founded. And these people could have been contacts of the communist parties around the world uh, at that time, uh, when Lenin and Trotsky were alive, when the Bolsheviks were in power. Uh, our comrade Ted Grant, who we call the unbroken thread uh, of our tendency to that epoch, was five years old when the Comintern was founded. He was 27 years old when Trotsky was murdered in 1940, and that was just four years before Comrade Alan Woods was born, who of course is still alive and well. And if anybody here gets to go to the Pan American School in Mexico this December, and I highly, highly recommend it, you will very likely get to meet Esteban Volkov, who is Trotsky's grandson. He's a close friend of the IMT, and he is literally a living connection to Trotsky and that, uh, that whole era. So this isn't ancient history that we're dealing with, and we have very real connection to these times. We know that for a variety of contingent reasons, the promise of the Russian Revolution and the Comintern weren't realized. It was a question of the preparedness of, the, of the, the parties, the leadership at that time, mistakes that were made, especially in places like Germany, and the revolution failed to spread. Stalinism killed off that phase of the World Revolution and eventually strangled and just discarded the Comintern itself. But the first four Congresses of the Comintern are an incredible uh, resource, a treasure trove of theoretical and organizational lessons for us, and that's what the IMT bases itself on, and we're going to be discussing that throughout the weekend. But even the Comintern had very humble beginnings. At the first Congress, there was only 51 delegates present. We have nearly double that here today. So just think about one half of this room or so is, is what founded the Comintern. Um, and they had people present from, from 22 countries. We have people present from 22 different cities and areas of this country. Um, the, the meeting took place in the middle of a terrible civil war. The first order of business of that meeting was to commemorate the murders of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, who had just been killed a few weeks before. Um, and the meetings took place in a, in a small, cold, narrow room in the Kremlin, much smaller than this one, only big enough for about 100 people, on flimsy chairs. I don't think they had red tablecloths. They certainly didn't have the kind of food that we're going to have because they were in the middle of an imperialist encirclement, and there often wasn't enough food for everybody. Um, and yet... The people present at that meeting, they understand, they understood that it's the ideas that are foremost. It's the program, the perspectives, the methods, uh, and above all, proletarian internationalism that was going to lead to the success of the World Socialist Revolution. Uh, and again, the IMT is, is based on this legacy, and I would say that we here in the United States in particular have a particularly important responsibility and role in, 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 in you know, making this happen in the next historical period. Because the IMT is a genuine international, not just organizationally in the sense that we have sections in other parts of the world, but above all, politically. And that's why we always start these meetings with political perspectives, and we start with world perspectives. Uh, because events around the world, they affect revolutions and revolutionaries in every other country on the planet. We know that revolutions don't respect borders, and we know that once the working class takes power in any country, even a relatively small country, that the whole dynamic, the class balance of forces, will be changed forever. Now, we live in a world of incessant wars, of crisis, of revolution, of counter-revolution, of counter-reforms, of instability. It's a world of sharp and sudden changes, as we often say. And I think we all know these little phrases, these words, at least on paper. But what we really have to do is internalize these ideas and make sure that a dialectical understanding of these processes is truly in our blood, in our bones, in our brains. Uh, and, and that's what we have to work on this weekend. Now, to be useful, perspectives, a perspective discussion, has to be more than just a collection of, of facts and figures, although facts and figures are very important. What we have to do is apply the method of dialectical materialism to analyze those facts and figures, to draw out the key trends, to figure out the most likely course of events, focusing on a few highlights and a few specific examples that can help illustrate those general processes. It's not about just like randomly throwing, you know, any, any numbers of facts and figures or trying to describe any possible thing that's happening in the world. 
But by learning from the experience of, of other workers, of other youth, of our own comrades around the world, both past and present, uh, we, we can be much better prepared for when these kinds of events, events like we've seen in Greece, events like we've seen in France, when those kinds of things happen in, in our country. Now, since the U.S. is such an important part of the world process, uh, and since we're on the eve of another uh, presidential election, I'm necessarily going to have to talk quite a lot about the United States in this lead-up, but let's look a little bit at the situation in Europe, um, uh, starting with Britain. And as comments know, things there are changing very, very quickly. I had to change my notes, frankly, on the drive down yesterday uh, because of, of changes that took place. And, you know, the, the Brexit fiasco, it's really astonishing. I mean, it really reveals that Britain's greatness is, is really long past. You know, we say, Trotsky said that the British ruling class used to measure, uh, you know, they had plans for decades and even centuries. Now they can't even plan a few weeks or even a few days ahead. They, 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 they have no foresight whatsoever. They're just scrambling from one thing to another with no real rhyme or reason. And a big part of this is that the British ruling class has lost control of two of the key political pillars of their domination in that country. And of course, for a certain historical period, those parties dominated, well, not the Labour Party, but, you know, but the British ruling class dominated the entire time. Now, the Tories, as I'm sure Connors have all been very amused to watch, they've been taken over by the, the Little England Brexiteers. Uh, they were stuck with Theresa May because, uh, you know, even though everybody hated her, especially her own party, because the alternative was worse. A blowout of the Tory party was not going to be pretty and will not be pretty, and having Corbyn come to power uh, on labor, on the basis of, of, a, of a mass movement with you know, you know, big aspirations for, for fundamental policy change, uh, that is not going to be very good as well. But what we're seeing is the civil war in the Tories is exploding before our very eyes. Uh, May has now had to resign. Poor little Theresa May, if the comments saw her, after failing three times to, to pass her Brexit plan. Um, and of course, capitalizing on all this chaos, you have the return of Nigel uh, Farage of UKIP infamy, who has now launched a new right-wing party, which is called the Brexit Party, a nice, uh, nice simple name. Um, and they have locked it ahead in the polls uh, from, from, from basically nothing in a very short period because they're cynically posing as an anti-establishment party, although many of the leaders of this party are from the establishment themselves. And slightly, it's very possible that they could be the winners of the upcoming EU elections, which is very ironic uh, in the first place that, that an anti-EU party would be the winner of the EU elections. But you know, people are fed up, and protest votes are going to be cast for this party. But that doesn't mean that this is the, the real mentality, this is the real state of, of, of the whole working class, of the British working class. Um, he's hated you know, by millions and millions of people. Comments may have seen that the police had to stop McDonald's from selling milkshakes near his rallies because, because there was a danger of having them thrown on his head. I mean, this, this, this is the, the, the kind of polarization that we're seeing uh, in jolly old England, which is uh, very not uh, jolly these days. As for the Labour Party, uh, the Blair X, Tony Blair and company, they tried in vain to turn the Labour Party into a kind of uh, US-style Democratic Party. Uh, but it's now been flooded by Corbyn supporters, and it's almost certain that it's going to come to power in the next period. The Blairites, uh, trying to you know head things off to the past, they've launched this, this party called Change UK uh, as a split up. Some of the Blairites are it, it, it's up to a completely pathetic start, uh, and they're trying to fill the so-called center of politics when the polarization of society and of politics has completely evaporated any any semblance of a center. Now, the stories, when they split, it's probably going to include, uh, you know, some of those Some of those people are going to try to go to the center, maybe even we'll join up with the, with the Blairite type people. Uh, the rest of the party is probably going to go even further to the right, um, you know, trying to compete with the Brexit party. They may even fuse with the Brexit party at a certain point. And some commentators say that if the Tory party even survives, which is pretty incredible, you know, statement to say that they would be unelectable for at least a generation. So obviously, you know, since we're fighting for socialism in our lifetime, this may be the last uh, uh, conservative Tory government we ever get to see in Britain. Um, so it's in this context that the work the Commons are doing in Britain is really uh, getting a big echo. For example, our campaign to reinstate Clause 4 of the British Labour Party Constitution, which Tony Blair took out, and it calls for the nationalization of the key levels of the economy, it's really caught on with major unions like the communications workers, and even uh, Jeremy Corbyn himself and his shadow chancellor, John McDonnell, 
have allowed themselves to be taken, had pictures taken in with the comrade Rob Sewell with his, you know, Fight for Claws Ford t-shirt um, uh, before them. So even there, in Norsen and said that they would speak at, at different campaigns in favor of this, basically, the socialist clause within the Labour Party. And this shows, again, also that our, our patient, but principled, but also flexible approach towards building uh, a cadre organization while also having this orientation to the traditional mass organization of the working class is now positioning us to make not only serious gains numerically, but to become a real factor in British politics and thereby in, in world politics. And of course, what our comrades argue for is that the only way forward for Corbyn and for Labour is to adopt real, genuine socialist policies, ultimately to carry through a socialist revolution, uh, and that's what our comrades are fighting for. Doesn't mean that we imagine that that's exactly what's going to happen through Corbyn, but, but uh, you know, he's going to be under a lot of pressure, not just the masses, but also from the ruling class to try to hold things together. But we have to explain that either in the EU or out of the EU or whatever bourgeois formation they have, there is no solution to the crisis of, of, of the working class and the suffering, the misery, the austerity that, that, we're, uh, that we're dealing with. And I think well, there's important differences between the US situation and the British situation. Obviously, number one, the Labour Party is a working class party. It's got organic ties to the trade unions, whereas the Democratic Party is a slaveholders and a capitalist party. It is not a workers party. But nonetheless, there are parallels in the way that the key political institutions of the ruling class are being pressured and pushed and stretched to the limit in places like Britain and also here in the United States. Now, every country has its own history, its own traditions, its own parties, but the same general process of polarization, of testing the old leaders, of testing the old organizations, of splits, of fusions, and of, uh, of eventual class clarification, this is taking place worldwide, and th this, this is finally really coming to the surface in a very apparent way after literally decades of, of people saying the class struggle is over, there is no working class, and blah, blah, blah. Now, if you look across the channel at France, in France, this movement took the form of the Yellow Vests, and I'm sure comrades have, have been following this for the last uh, six months or so. France has one of the most revolutionary traditions in the world, and anytime the French workers start to move, we should pay attention because, because it can really set the tone for Europe and, and for the world, and we can learn a lot of lessons here. Now, to summarize the main lines in France, and this is essentially the same, the same basic setup in every European country and, and uh, with this or that change in every country in the world. The, the main situation in France is that uh, Macron, the, the, the president of France, he represents French capitalism. Now, French capitalism is rotten, and its only alternative is to impose even more austerity on the working class. Now, the French people, they've had decades of austerity. I mean, they used to have one of the best qualities of life, you know, even back as, as, as recently as the 80s, uh, and, and decades of austerities for, for retired people, for farmers, for small shopkeepers, for the workers. And after 2008, this accelerated, and the French people have had enough of austerity. Now, the traditional workers' organizations, the parties, the trade unions, their leaders are completely rotten, and they give no lead, or they just outright betray the masses. For years, the labor leaders would call these days of action. I think they had like over 30 days of action in France, which were just like little demonstrations to let off steam. They weren't actually trying to shut down the government. They weren't actually trying to shut down production. And eventually, people wouldn't even start showing up to those kinds of things. I mean, if you're a single mom with two kids and you have two jobs, you, you, you don't have time to just go out for a day of action and to miss work for something like that when it's not going to help you pay the rent. That's not attractive to millions of ordinary people. And when they did call strikes, they would only get sort of the... the, the you know, like the professional people that work for the unions to come out on the picket lines. They wouldn't try to mobilize general, you know, general strikes, certainly, or even the whole uh, of, the, of, the, of the workforce of a particular workplace. And so in different sectors over the last few years, the dock workers, the oil refinery workers, the railway workers, they had strikes, but they ended up being isolated. They weren't supported by, by solidarity strikes of other, other uh, uh, workplaces, and they ended up losing their struggles. The other factor, of course, is that the masses in France can't just wait for the IMT to come along and build a mass revolutionary party that, that's clear and knows what to do and, and, and can make this happen. Uh, and so there's a vacuum there in, in France and other countries, and this is a finished recipe for, for social conflagrations, for confusion, and, and for, frankly, for chaos. And into this vacuum came the Yellow Vest movement. Now, these people, you know, kind of 
you know, spontaneously emerged. They sort of emerged out of the woodwork of French society. Millions of people who were alienated from politics, alienated from the trade unions, and yet they'd had enough. They hadn't benefited en at all from any of the economic, so-called economic recovery of the last period. And that's why they went outside the channels of the trade unions and, 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 and went sort of on the streets on their own with blockades uh, because they, didn't, they weren't interested in the conservatism of the trade union leaders. Now, the, the, the sort of revolutionary elan, the, the, the almost insurrectionary attitude of a lot of these people, like we're going to, like storming the Bastille almost, like 1789 all over again, it comes from the fact that they aren't burdened by bureaucracy. They aren't burdened by defeats of the past. Uh, they're not bound by the rules of how you're supposed to fight the class struggle, uh, according to the trade union leaders. Um, but this also means that there's a lot of lack of structure. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of chaos. There's even fascist elements that have put on yellow vests and have gotten involved and are, and, are, and are part of the chaos. Now these weekly, they started out as weekly demonstrations and they've been going on now for six months. But there's limits to how long this kind of a tactic can go until you start mobilizing in an organized way the heavy battalions of the workers. And it's very clear, I think, that the steam is running out, at least for this, uh, this stage of struggle. And so, but the problem is, of course, that although Macron has survived so far, nothing has changed, no fundamental problems have been resolved. Um, and so, you know, I think we can see that there's a before and an after of the Yellow Vest movement. The methods of struggle of the French working class have been transformed by this. They're not satisfied with days of action anymore. And, and I think a very important factor, a feature in the last period, is that you've had an increase in strikes now in France alongside the Yellow Vest movement, and, uh, and, and, and some of them have been quite militant. Now, the, the, the ruling class of other parts of Europe have been very worried about this. There were sort of mini yellow vest type movements in places like Belgium, uh, but even Germany, uh, big old powerful Germany, worried that this kind of thing or something like it could spread to Germany because after decades of relative prosperity in Germany, things are grinding to a halt there and, and, and there's a, again a finished recipe for, for big movements of the class struggle in, in that country which is the most important country in Europe, 80 million people right in the heart of, of Europe, the most industrialized country and so on. So the main problem with the capitalist governments everywhere is that their policies, which they implement on behalf of the capitalist class as a whole, clash with the needs of the masses who are sick of austerity. Uh, and you see this in one, one place after another. Spain is another textbook example. The recent elections really show the deep polarization in, in that society, as well as the revolutionary traditions and also the counter-revolutionary traditions in that country. And of course, in Spain, you've got the added dynamic of, of, of the national question um, in, in, in the Basque country, but in particular in Catalonia, in Italy as well. I think comments should keep an eye on Italy. It's one of the, the, sick, uh, the sick men of Europe, uh, as, they, as they say, and it's one of the weakest links of European capitalism and they also have really profound revolutionary traditions. And, uh, you know, again, at any day, some big movement could be sparked. Now, moving elsewhere in the Mediterranean, uh, you know, the, the Arab Revolution, the North African Revolution, has kind of roared back to life in Algeria, a place that really wasn't affected too much back in the first wave in 2011. And from, uh, and from there, or, or also as part of this process, you're also seeing incredible events in, in places like in Sudan. So in Algeria... Uh, Abdelaziz Bouteflika, who had uh, ruled for 20 years, was overthrown by the masses. You know, we saw over and over again in 2011 that sort of more or less spontaneous revolutionary movements overthrew these, these corrupt and rotten dictators that had been there for, for decades in many cases. But again, as we saw in places like Egypt or Tunisia or elsewhere, due to the lack of a revolutionary party, revolutionary leadership, uh, present in sufficient numbers, you see elements of the military or of the old regime uh, tr oh, and of, of imperialism, of course, trying to fill that vacuum, calm the masses down, you know, everybody go home, okay, we got rid of the dictator, yay, yay, everybody go home, but really trying to rule, uh, you know, on, uh, basically with the same regime. They want to make it look like something's changed when really nothing fundamental has changed. And of course, the masses aren't stupid. They can see that this is happening around them, but at the same time, if you don't have that revolutionary leadership in place, in advance, that can you know, catalyze that and move it in the direction of the ultimate overthrow, not just of an individual or of a regime, but of the whole system, then eventually, through chaos, through attrition, they can eventually you know, reestablish uh, control. And similarly in, in Sudan, if comments watched any videos of the really inspiring, incredible movement in, in Sudan that over, uh, overthrew al-Bashir, as well as a second uh, ruler, uh, Ibn Auf, who was put in power, handpicked by him, overthrown right away. There also, 
the army has stepped in to try to calm things down. Uh, you know, there too, there'll probably be a prolonged uh, chaotic period because there, there just isn't a revolutionary party in place to make it happen uh, all the way. Now, if you look elsewhere in Africa, if you look at South Africa, for example, uh, the recent elections there reveal, again, an incredible powder keg of revolutionary potential in South Africa. You see the, the, the decay and the decline and the crisis of the ANC, the, the ruling party since the end of apartheid. And you also see the, the rise in the potential of a group called the Economic Freedom Fighters, uh, who, who have a ton of potential. And by the way, some of the leaders of the Economic Freedom Fighters, they, they, they were educated in Marxism by the Marxism FAQ that we have on our website and you, you know, used to share. I mean, and some of these people who were just like high school kids or college kids checking out our website have now let, you know, they, they've turned into like parliamentary leaders and stuff like that, leading, you know, th this force that there's a lot of confusion still, but there's potential there in South Africa for really incredible events. And I don't have time to go into detail, but if, uh, as always, uh, a comrade Ben Morkin from South Africa has wonderful articles about this stuff that you should be reading on Marxist.com. Coming back over to the Western Hemisphere, in Brazil, we have the Bolsonaro regime and, and, and the, the mass protests that have, had have shaken his uh, fundamentally weak uh, you know, government already. And why is his government fundamentally weak? Although a lot of people in Brazil included where you know, there's so much despair when he won and oh, fascism has come to power and, and all this kind of stuff. And we explain, no, the working class is not defeated. The youth are not defeated. Uh, people are just pissed off and angry. And it's a protest vote. You know, a lot of people are angry. The petty bourgeoisie is all riled up. But, but it's fundamentally weak because Brazilian capitalism is fundamentally weak. And brute repression can only get you so far for so long when you're the minority class. And so after a period of initial demoralization, the youth have started to wake up again. Uh, just within months, incredible uh, protest movement. And the, the, the difference from Brazil, as say compared to South Africa or Algeria or Sudan, is that we do have a relatively sizable group in Brazil, a section of the IMT. Uh, now, they're not big enough to be a decisive factor yet, but the conditions are there for them to really build out of this movement and, and to really, you know, in the next few years, turn into something that can start to have an impact on national politics. And of course, right next door to Brazil, we have in Venezuela, where the ongoing crisis between revolution and counter-revolution, uh, imperialist meddling, it continues to grind on and on and on and on. And, and yet we continually see that the masses surprisingly, frankly, and inspiringly continue to, to, to tenaciously hold out and will not let the old ruling class return, even though, of course, uh, the Maduro government is completely rotten, it's completely incapable of defending the revolution. But that really shows the depths of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the roots of the revolution of the last 20, 20 plus years, and the fact that there's a such strong anti-imperialist sentiment, even among big chunks of the Venezuelan military. So as comrades can see, there's so much happening over the world. I've barely covered a couple, a couple of countries. Uh, it's impossible to do it all. But there is one unifying factor in all of this instability, and that is the crisis of the capitalist economy. And there's just a huge disconnect between the objective potential that exists to meet everybody's needs, which is basically already in place on a world scale, and the profit system. And the masses are starting to realize this, they're starting to notice this, and they're starting to do something about it. Uh, so even if a lot of people around the world don't know exactly what they want, they're pretty clear about what they do not want. Now, Donald Trump, he is the, he's the, moving, moving right along. Donald Trump is the perfect personification of the rottenness of capitalism in this epoch of its terminal decline and, and crisis and decay. But his crude policies, his crude mannerisms, his crude everything, um, it, it's not just due to like personal eccentricities or whatever. It's ultimately a reflection of the rottenness, the crudeness, uh, and the precarity of the system as a whole. His America First policy, this nationalist policy, is really the only logical policy for U.S. capitalism if it wants to continue being the premier world power. And the liberals, of course, lament that this is the case, or they would rather not be so blunt about it. But really, in, in, in this period of crisis and of decline, it's the only kind of policy that they can, can really adopt. Now, we've explained in many of our documents that globalization allowed the capitalists of the main capitalist powers, imperialist powers above all, to partially and temporarily overcome the limitations of the national uh, borders and of the, the national economies. Uh, but everything that drove globalization 
for a whole period is now starting to pull things into reverse. And based on falling exports in a number of important countries, the Brookings Institute is now predicting a synchronized slowdown of the world economy, which is, which is a really, you know, has really big implications uh, for the future. And this is why the knives are out and all the capitalists are, are fighting each other to export unemployment and to export ultimately social unrest to their neighbors and to their rivals um, because they're desperate to at least ride out the world crisis themselves. But the present ongoing crisis, it's not a temporary crisis. It's organic and it's, 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 it's frankly an existential crisis of capitalism. It simply can't recreate the, the, the very specific conditions that allowed for the post-war boom, which was uh, really an anomaly period of capitalism. Those 30, 40 years or so, give or take, were an anomaly of capitalism. This is more the norm of capitalism. The, you know, what, the, the 50s and 60s, that's not the norm. This is more the norm, and they're going to keep trying to, 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 to throw the clock back further and further. And, of course, the workers' subjective consciousness of this reality is catching up very quickly. So the capitalists don't have time on their side. And I think perhaps the clearest expression of this is the, the sharpening tensions and the trade war going on between the U.S. and China. Uh, despite the, uh, the early photo ops uh, and all the smiles and, you know, having dinner and whatever, golfing with uh, Xi Jinping and stuff like that, uh, China is a strategic competitor of U.S. capitalism and, and has to be contained on all fronts, economic, diplomatic, military. Uh, Trump recently raised tariffs on about $200 billion of Chinese imports. He raised them from 10% to 25%, and China, three days later, raised their tariffs on $60 billion dollars of American uh, exports uh, to China. <clears throat> now, the United States has more overall economic clout than China, so Ch uh, Trump obviously thinks that he can weather the storm a little bit better. Um, he thinks that it won't be so bad that the Chinese will be forced to pay the tariff because, uh, or, or you know, be bullied into, into you know, making other changes uh, because they want access to U.S. markets. But as even like some of the Treasury officials, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump administration officials have acknowledged, it's actually US, many U.S. companies are being affected by this, and it's U.S. companies that are going to have to pay these tariffs, and it's U.S. consumers that are then going to have to have these costs passed along to them. And even before this latest round of tariff war, it, it, it's been having an effect. Um, a lot of uh, farmers, you know, you, you might have seen Trump lately is really trying to shore up support among farmers uh, because a lot of them are like totally devastated by these economic policies and are starting to, to grumble. Now, over a six month period that ended in March, exports from the United States to China dropped by 26% compared to a year earlier. Some of this was offset by increased uh, exports to places like the European Union and Mexico, but Mexico is hardly gonna make up for, for, for China, and the European Union has a lot of problems and is not a guaranteed market for very long either. Uh, during the same period, imports from China declined by 5%. But China you know, specifically targeted some of these tariffs to places like Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Texas, Iowa, North Carolina, some of those, those key sort of Trump states uh, in the last elections. And soybean farmers in the United States, they've seen exports drop by 80%, an 80% drop in, in soybean exports. Uh, exports. And that's almost, there's, uh, there's almost a billion bushels of soybeans sitting in warehouses right now uh, because there's nowhere to export them to and there's no market to sell them on. That's, that's 60 billion pounds of soybeans. Uh, this is a, a classic example of, of overproduction on a capitalist basis. Now, Trump last year paid soybean and other farmers $12 billion to sort of ease the pain of this. He's talking about giving them $15 billion more dollars this year alone. Now, according to the World Bank, it would cost just $7 billion to eliminate undernutrition worldwide. And yet he's got $15 billion, he's got twice that just to sort of get, get some political support from these people. Um, as always, there's plenty of money for that kind of thing, but not for food, for nutrition, for healthcare, for housing. And, and just imagine, I mean, 60 billion pounds of, of soybeans, that's like eight pounds per human on the planet, and it's just sitting there unused. I mean, just to talk about the waste of this, of this system. Um, and of course, China, it has a, a, uh, a different kind of regime, and they also feel that they can hold out maybe longer in this uh, game of tariff chicken, um, because they also have very important things at stake. I mean, uh, China is a, is, a, is a regional imperialist power. It has worldwide aspirations, and it already has growing influence around the world. 
but uh, it mainly needs to shore up its, its military and economic base in its own backyard, whereas the United States is trying to do this around the whole planet. China, in the region at least, has a, a lot of economic support. Places like Australia or Brazil or, or South Africa, for example, even, which isn't in the region. Uh, but because of all the, the, the raw materials that they've been sort of vacuuming up for the last couple of decades, uh, you know, there was a lot of money that went into those countries and a lot of, therefore, some political influence. It's also pumped billions of dollars into 152 different countries and uh, organizations uh, for its so-called Belt and Road Initiative, its attempt to sort of relaunch the Silk Road. Uh, and it's not only places like Pakistan and Kazakhstan and Indonesia that he's put money, but places like Italy, Greece, Luxembourg, Russia, and even Switzerland is getting Chinese money for, for the Belt and Road Initiative. And the regime in China is desperate to keep the domestic market growing, uh, and they've put tons of money into you know, keeping that afloat. But over the last 10 years, their debt levels have, have doubled, basically, effectively, uh, and they now don't want to rely on so much debt because that is uh, untenable. Uh, with the world economy slowing down now, the Chinese economy is also slowing down. Last year, it grew at only 6.6%. Now, if the United States grew at 6.6%, that would be pretty much incredible. That was the last time the U.S. saw that kind of growth was in 1966 during the buildup to the Vietnam War. But 6.6% for China is, uh, is nothing compared to the 14.2% it had in 2007. It's less than half of what it had just about a decade ago. So there's, there's a lot at stake, and in some ways, neither side can afford this trade war. And yet, at the same time, neither side can afford not to to do it. It's not, but it's not just about profits and prestige, but ultimately about the danger of social uh, revolution. And, and as we've said before, there's a reason that the Chinese bureaucracy spends more on internal security than on national defense, uh, because the Chinese working class is the largest in the world, it has a militant history, and we're already seeing big movements of workers and, uh, and of students as well in solidarity with the workers in China. The U.S. it's increased naval patrols in the East and South China Seas, uh, and China, of course, is, is, is trying to expand its influence uh, uh, territorially and militarily in the region. Um, and there's already proxy wars raging between the U.S. and China in different parts of the world, like Syria, Yemen. The, there's tensions rising in the Horn of Africa, places like Baluchistan and stuff like that. But I think that it's fair to say that for a variety of reasons, uh, including the presence of nuclear weapons, but above all, the class balance of forces, the strength of the world working class, that a serious military conflict is ruled out between China and the U.S., at least for the immediate future, and that's why they have to turn to diplomacy and, and trade wars. But these things can, of course, take on a life of their own. At a certain stage, if, if the U.S. feels that their, uh, their, their fall is going, you know, is going too fast and China's rise is coming too fast, they might want to try to stop or slow down China's rise. And that's kind of the basis for Trotsky's uh, you know, idea that there might be a war with, between Britain and the United States in the 1930s. Um, but so we should never say never, but at the same time, we, we, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be worried that every time, you know, a plane is intercepted or a boat is, you know, held for a while that there's going to be a, a, a nuclear war in the, in the Pacific or something like that. Um, because a war with China would not be like a war with Iraq, uh, even if it's very limited in scope. Uh, just a couple quick points on some other aspects of Trump's foreign policy. Um, Trump's foreign policy team is now dominated by neoconservative hawks, people from the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld era, and even earlier. Uh, and the results of this can be seen with this, you know, rising uh, bellicosity in relation to Iran uh, and, of course, Venezuela. But even a war with Iran would not be as easy as the war with Iraq was. Iran has doubled the population, it has doubled the GDP, it has a much more advanced uh, military and much larger. Uh, and they would, of course, also have the backing of Russia, which is a very interesting uh, regional imperialist power that needs to be taken into account. And as far as an invasion of Venezuela, that would also not be so easy, given, again, the deep uh, anti-imperialist feelings of the masses there. Then, of course, there's a situation in North Korea, which a deal that uh, Trump hasn't been able to make, uh, where Kim Jong-un, obviously, he wants to keep his head while also, you know, keeping control over the transition of, of, uh, of, of that country from a deformed worker state to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to, to capitalism, to full-on capitalism. And so he's balancing between all the different regional powers, between China, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and, and the United States. And it seems that he may have outsmarted uh, Trump, at least for now. Uh, but getting back to China just a little bit more, it's, uh, the United States is also restricting 
uh, direct foreign investment of Chinese companies into the United States, especially in technology and artificial intelligence. And that explains this, uh, this tension over Huawei, this company Huawei, which we've analyzed in the past. Um, and now they're even saying that Chinese made drones, these toys that people fly around, that they might be sending data back to the Chinese government. And as it turns out, 80% of drones sold in the United States come from one company based in Shenzhen in China. So, uh, I mean, so, the, 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 you know, the, the U.S. ruling class is worried on a, on a number of levels. And there's some people that say that this could lead to some kind of a new Cold War or at least uh, an acceleration of deglobalization. And you might even have like two world blocks crystallizing, a Chinese block that might have its own Internet. They call it the Splinter Net uh, and, and, and a U.S. block dominated by U.S. companies. So we'll see we'll see what happens in the next period. But this is definitely not. Uh, not the, the, the world that we grew up in in the last period. As for the U.S. economy, uh, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when there's going to be a next economic crisis. I saw yesterday that the Dow Jones has fallen for five weeks in a row for the first time since 2011. Is it possible this is the beginning? You know, we'll see, I guess we'll see what happens on Monday, <coughs> or maybe Tuesday, rather. They get an extra day off uh, before things. But, you know, we're not in the business of predicting exactly when this is going to happen, but we know that the internal contradictions of the system will lead to another crisis. And it's not that we want the crisis. We don't want the suffering that people are going to have to go through because of this crisis. Um, but we know it's going to happen because last time, the so-called Great Recession, it was really, really painful for a lot of people. It lasted from the fourth quarter of 2007 to the second quarter of 2009. Uh, over 8 million jobs were lost. Over $8 trillion in household wealth were wiped out. Over 10 million Americans lost their homes. Uh, and the bailouts that the government made, the TARP bailouts, they said at first it was like $900 million. Turns out it was actually $16.8 trillion, which is more than the entire annual GDP of China, which is pretty insane. Um, but of course, superficially, everything's been looking really good for, for Trump. We're now in the longest bull market in history. Uh, the Dow Jones is up 20,000 points, or it was until recently. The S&P 500 was up over 300%. The NASDAQ was up over 500%. Unemployment is relatively low compared to the crisis. Corporate profits, are, they rose 16.2% last year uh, after a 6.5% gain in 2017. But, but again, nothing has been solved since 2008, and all they've done is lay the foundations for an even bigger crisis next time around. For example, if you look at, uh, at capacity utilization, which measures how much industrial or productive capacity is used to produce commodities, uh, and this is an index that measures 71 different industries uh, in manufacturing, 16 in mining, and two in utilities. So it's a pretty broad measure of the backbone of the economy. Uh, at the peak of the post-war boom in 1967, 89% of capacity was being utilized. Uh, now, this shows you that even when the economy, when the country, the capitalism is running at top speed, it still can't use, you know, full, uh, you know, the full amount of the capacity that it has. Um, in December 2007, just before the, the, the last crisis broke out, it was at 81%. So that means that 19% of productive capacity sat idle. By June of the next year, 2009, well, at the, the bottom of the trough of the last crisis, only 66% of capacity was being used. That means that fully one third wasn't being used. That means like, you know, you know, so much more, you know, and it's not because people didn't need jobs, that people didn't have skills to operate that stuff, that people don't need the things that can be produced with that. It's because of course, if they can't produce for a profit, they're not gonna produce anything. Now, 10 years into the recovery, it's at just 78%. It hasn't even reached the pre-crisis peak uh, from 2007. Um, and so that means that, uh, you know, there's just all this waste taking place around us uh, because of this system. Now, GDP last year was 2.9%. U.S. GDP grew by 2.9%. But this was mainly driven by deficit spending. Um, and then in the year before that, it was just 2.2%. And that was driven by Trump's tax cuts, all the money that all of a sudden flooded uh, uh, rich people in particular. Now, tax cuts and the, the interest rates of the Federal Reserve, they've been kept uh, very, very low. The tax cuts have, have pumped a lot of money into the economy, and they've used this to stimulate the economy to prolong this particular boom in the hopes 
that this time it's different. There will be no slump, but we know that there will be a slump eventually. And by using those tools now, before the crisis, they have even fewer tools to use when, when, when the crisis does hit. And of course, the public is not going to be so keen on giving so many bailouts uh, last time around. Now, the, the, the debt in the United States, it's $22 trillion now. It's double what it was in 2008. And that works out to about $182,000 per taxpayer. Um, so if you pay taxes, you owe on top of your taxes $182,000. That's never going to be paid back. Um, and of course, we all know the fact, the figures about the, the disparity between the rich and poor. The 0.1% the richest own as much as the bottom 90 uh, percent of the population, and three people hold as much wealth as about uh, 160 million people, the, the poorest 160 million people. Three people, three individuals own that. If we were a, a tributary feudal society, you could say that each of these people owns or controls about 53 million people. And that's equivalent to each of them basically owning or controlling the whole of South Korea, for example, just one individual controlling that much, uh, you know, labor basically. Um, and American workers are working harder than ever, but of course, it's not it's not getting us anywhere. Productivity is actually up in a lot of sectors of the United States, but hourly wages adjusted for inflation have barely changed. Uh, wages rose by about three percent in 2018, but inflation was over two percent. So you actually got less than one percent actual meaningful wage increase on average in, uh, in the United States. But for some workers, like factory workers, average hourly pay actually has been falling in the last period. At the same time, um, you know, you see that 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, 58% have less than $1,000 in savings for emergencies, a fifth of Americans have zero money or negative net worth, um, and of course adjusted for inflation, uh, hourly wages peaked 46 years ago. Now, the fight for 15, a lot of people talk about fighting for $15 an hour, but even that isn't enough for uh, affordable housing in this country. Uh, for example, you need to make nearly $18 an hour on average just to get a one-bedroom apartment, uh, and that doesn't count places, that's the average. Places like New York or San Francisco, I mean, it's completely unaffordable. And that's if you even get $15. I mean, if you get $15, but the national minimum wage is $7.25. Uh, and a, a study by MIT found that a family of four with two adults working and two children would have to work four full-time minimum jobs. That's a 76-hour work week each just to have a living wage. Um, if you're a single mother with two children earning $7.25 an hour, you would have to work 24 hours a day for six days a week. Uh, that's 144 hours a week just to cover your basic necessities. That's complete insanity. And let's not forget that these are the good times. This is before the crisis. Um, and people seem to intuit that the crisis might be coming. Uh, uh, you know, uh, only 20% of consumers think that things are going to be better six months from now than they are today. And of course, you have a president who is deeply unpopular. The only rating that he has above 50% uh, is on the economy. And he's taken full credit for the economy. He says this is all due to him. Uh, so you can, you can imagine he's going to get a lot of the blame as well. As far as CEOs, they've got a pretty good idea about the economy. Only 14% of them think things are going to be better in the next six months. Uh, I, and 42% think that they're going to be worse. So, you know, again, we can't predict the crisis exactly, but something seems to be brewing here. Uh, we, in the, in the last issue of Socialist Revolution magazine, we had some very interesting quotes and on the website from some billionaires who are very worried about what's going on with their system. This guy, Ray Dalio, uh, he's the 79th richest person in the world, just kind of a, you know, a chump in the billionaire world, but he's only number 79. But he says, I'm a capitalist and even I think capitalism is broken. Capitalism is at a juncture. Americans could reform it together or will do it in conflict. In other words, uh, you know, they know there's, there's problems coming. They know their system can't go on like this, but they can't do anything about it because the only thing you can do to end the contradictions of capitalism is to get rid of capitalism. And that's the one thing, the one thing that these people are not going to be able to do. Now, the next crisis, the next crash, it's not necessarily going to make our work easier. Um, we were proved 100% right in 2008 in terms of Marxist economics, but that didn't automatically do the recruiting for us. Uh, it didn't build for us. You know, our friends and families will be affected, will be affected. The organization's finances will be effective. 
Um, and it's going to have a contradictory effect on, on class consciousness. Some workers may be more combative because they literally have nothing to lose, but others will be so scared at losing what little they have left that they might not be uh, so willing uh, uh, to strike. But there's no doubt that it's going to accelerate this development of class consciousness in this country, and we can be sure that really, really awful austerity is going to be on the measure of the day. Now, let's see. I think very important, we've seen even before the crisis, though, that you have a rise in labor struggles. I think comrades have been very excited over the last year or so to see what's been going on. We've predicted a, a revival of labor for many years, and it seems to be materializing. Um, we often explain that sometimes strikes increase when the economy starts to stabilize and the workers want to get a, a bit of a share of, what, of all the wealth. And of course, uh, the economy isn't that stable, but the workers, it's been 10 years since the last crisis, and they want what's theirs. Now, we've seen a, a big decline in strikes and union membership over the last 40 years. Uh, the percentage of union members fell again last year, although the overall numbers were about the same because of population growth. Um, but, mm, mm, sorry, I need some water. That's something caught in my throat. Um, a couple years ago, we said that strike levels were so low that there's nowhere to go but up. And we saw in 2012, the Chicago teachers gave us an idea of what this might look like, but it really takes years to organize the, the kind of infrastructure that a union needs for, for a strike to come out. And so there wasn't a whole lot going on since 2012, but last January, we had 35,000 school teachers and, and support uh, staff teachers come out on strike in West Virginia. They shut down the whole state, basically. Uh, they were protesting a very small 1% pay wage, uh, pay raise. They ended up uh, winning a 5% raise and, and a temporary freeze in the healthcare uh, cuts that were going to be imposed on them. But they shut down the, every single county, every single school basically in that state. And that's a red state, remember, a so-called Trump state, uh, you know, because of the struggle. And this inspired workers in other places uh, and teachers in six other states soon followed. Now, in 2018, after all these record lows that we've gone through for the last period, uh, the number of workers that were involved in strikes and lockouts was the highest it's been since 1986. Now, how many of you were not alive in 1986? Okay, so it's been a while since, we went, since we've seen something like this. So we, we shouldn't take it for granted if you're just entering political activity and like, oh, workers are always going on strike. Not, not necessarily. Uh, it's been a while. But, but, you know, but even that is quite low. There were 20 strikes and lockouts last year. But if you look at the figures in the 1980s, there was an average of 69 per year. In the, in, the, in the 1970s, 269 strikes per year. And we had 20, so that's much better than seven, which is what it was the year before. But it's really only the beginning of the beginning. Um, now, 90% of the teachers that were on, of the people that were on strike last year were, uh, you know, in education or healthcare workers in particular. And it was 485,000 workers, less than half a million, that went out on strike. But look at the inspiration that people got from just less than 500,000 workers. There are 130 million workers in this country, and that doesn't count their families, just actual people that work, 130 million. So the ones that were on strike last year represent 0.3%, 0.3% of the workforce. So there's a lot of room to expand in this country, and there was a chain reaction from West Virginia to Oklahoma and, and, and Arizona and California, and, and this is already starting to spill over into the private sector, because for workers, Private, public sector, you know, most workers don't, don't really know the difference. They just know they need better wages, conditions, protections, etc. So in December of last year, 8,000 housekeepers, bartenders, and other service workers walked off the job at two dozen hotels, uh, everywhere from Detroit to Maui. Uh, and it's the, it was the biggest hotel workers strike in U.S. history, and it led also to a victory. They got wage increases, and they also got contracts that would force Marriott hotels to include GPS-enabled panic buttons in case housekeepers feel unsafe when they're, they're, they're in a room with a client. And the, the, they also... And the company had to agree to ban guests who have a, a history of uh, sexually harassing workers. So these are very interesting demands to be putting into union contracts. Just recently in New England, 31,000 workers walked out of uh, stop and shop grocery stores, 241 stores. Uh, in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, uh, they were also going to have their wages cut, their health care cut, etc. Um, and they had enormous community solidarity. You know, a lot of people, they would re refuse to cross the picket line. People were bringing the strikers uh, meals. And in the end, 
they, they, they won a victory as well. In Oregon, teachers recently walked out of 600 schools, uh, not for wages or benefits, but for smaller classroom sizes, more nurses, more librarians, more art, music, and physical education programs, more school supplies. 94% of teachers have to spend out of pocket for school supplies for their kids. I mean, so, so, I mean, these are social demands that are now starting to creep into these economic struggles of the working class. It's not just greedy teachers who want to make more money. Um, and, and of course, comrades have seen recently the disgusting news about the school lunches, kids that are being shamed into not having, uh, you know, because they can't afford what may be their only secure meal of the day. And I think, you know, people across the board are starting to get fed up. So it's not just the strike numbers, but it's the attitudes of people towards the unions. Uh, it's the attitude of people towards being part of the working class, this awareness that's rising. And public opinion of unions is now at the highest it's ever been in 15 years. And this, of course, you know, the unions aren't doing anything to earn that or to deserve that. Uh, the, union leader, uh, the union leadership, at least, they're not doing that. And, and so what we're seeing in these struggles that have been erupting is that there's, there's a militant minority of class struggle activists, some of them who even consider themselves socialists, who are willing to fight not just the bosses, but also their own union leaderships, if need be, to, to, to take the workers out on strike. And we're seeing that that's, 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 that's working. And so just as the Yellow Vest movement spread across France, you can have this kind of thing start to spread in the next period. You don't yet have a militant class struggle wing of the labor movement arising as such, but you can start to see the outlines of one in the next period. And of course, all of this is being reflected in the AFL-CIO, which is the main labor federation in the United States. It represents 12.5 million unionized workers. And for the last, you know, as long as one can remember, they've been cowardly, they've been class collaborationists, they've been, uh, you know, basically working with Trump instead of working to overthrow Trump. Uh, and the potential power of these unions and of this federation, just, just the AFL-CIO alone, le le leave aside the, 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 the unions that make it up. AFL-CIO has assets of $67 million and annual revenues of $180 million. Uh, that's more than some Fortune 500 companies. I mean, just imagine what they could do in terms of on-the-ground campaigns, of, of media, you know, instead of our little paper, imagine the, the sort of pro-working class, pro-class struggle, uh, you know, magazines, television programs, YouTube stations, whatever that they could, that they could have. Um, but of course, the core power of this union is its ability to mobilize the working class in strikes and solidarity strikes and general strikes. But that's the very last thing that the current leadership wants. But we always say you can't judge the immediate future from the immediate past. Uh, we obviously, we have to look at where things are coming from, but that's not the only gauge for where things are going to go. And we're among the only ones uh, whether left or right, who said the unions are not dead yet. People were writing them off. They were saying they're, they're dead. Even the union leaders themselves were accepting, oh, this is all over. We should just roll over and wait till we retire. And too bad if, the re you know, if, if everyone else uh, doesn't have a union. But we know that as long as capitalism exists, the workers are going to have to band together collectively to defend their economic interests. And that the front line of that defense is in unions. So big changes are taking place. Comrades may have seen there's this video that was tweeted by the official AFL-CIO account about how workers need to seize the means of production. Uh, and you had a roofing, a roofer worker who was, uh, you know, claims to be a Marxist who gave a not terribly bad overview of classes and he attacked the idea of the middle class and stuff like that. Um, and, and, you know, the idea that we're all middle class, that's been one of the pillars of the labor uh, movement for the last period. Now, just because the interns at the AFL-CIO went a little wild uh, one week doesn't mean that Richard Trump is going to call for a nationalization of the Fortune 500 uh, or an insurrection or anything like that. But it is symptomatic, and it shows that there's pressure growing in the union. And Trumpka, who's been the president for 10 years now, he's a very wily character. He's from the Pittsburgh area, so you should keep, keep an eye, keep an eye on, on these people. He's very, I mean, this guy is very conniving, and, and it shouldn't surprise if, if he shifts a little bit to the left to try to confuse people and, and, and show that, you know, he's got some, some class struggle credentials, which he does. He actually was involved in some important uh, mining strikes back in the 1970s. But very interesting is that um, uh, th there's a lot of anger against Trumpka and a lot of people that want to get rid of him, he, his own staffers, rank and file, because he hasn't organized. They call him a failed leader. The, the labor movement has been in decline during his entire regime, even though he said that he would turn things around from the days of Sweeney, John Sweeney, and other people that came before him. And the AFL-CIO is holding elections in 2021, and probably the main candidate 
is a woman named Sarah Nelson. Comments may have heard of her. She's the international president of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA. And by the way, our magazine is, is uh, unionized by the CWA, so we're, we got a little connection there. Um, and she recently emerged as a really militant, gut, gutsy uh, leader of a very strategic sector of the airline workers uh, during the, the, the shutdown in January over the border wall. And she said, we need a general strike to stop this stupid shutdown, basically. And very quickly, Trump ordered the, the workers back to work. And as she put it, she says, only direct action or the threat of it will move the boss. And that has to be the, the basic principle of the labor movement. She's a fresh face. She's got a totally different attitude and could definitely give Trump a, a run for his money. She also has a solid record of fighting against uh, sexual harassment in the airline industry, which is, which is rampant. And if you compare that to the sort of Trumpka's good old boys network, you can see that there's going to be a lot of appeal, but he's going to do everything he can to, get in, uh, to stay in power. Now, we shouldn't have any illusions in anybody, including Sarah Nelson, but if she were to beat Trump, uh, it, it would change a lot of things, and it could unleash all kinds of pent-up forces which could get out of control of the labor leaders, and Trump himself, if he's forced to shift a bit to the left, could unleash things. Um, so we'll have to see what happens there. Uh, and, 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 you know, this, the idea that we're always putting forward, the need for a mass workers' party, for a mass labor party, for a mass socialist party based on the unions, you know, the, 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 that need is going to come more and more to the fore. And, of course, that brings us to the 2020 elections. And uh, as, as we've said, <clears throat> what we're witnessing is the unfolding of the crisis of the regime of the most powerful capitalist country on the planet. All the key institutions of capitalism are, are in crisis. The presidency, Congress, the Supreme Court, and even the Constitution uh, is, is under question. They're talking about constitutional crises almost every week. There's all kinds of fault lines in that Constitution, uh, which is a patchwork of things that was, that's been stretched to accommodate 232 years of capitalist development through very different conditions. Um, and let's be clear, a constitutional crisis, a serious one, would be calling into question the piece of paper uh, that allows for the, the rule of, of, of this country. So, I mean, this is not something that, that happens uh, that often. Uh, in the manifesto, Marx says that all that is solid melts into air, and that includes the United States, it includes U.S. imperialism, it includes its state apparatus, it includes its economy, and it includes the grip of, of, of the ruling class on the minds of the masses. Um, and so this, this crisis of the two parties is really a big part of, of, this, uh, of this process. Now, as of a couple days ago, I don't know, it could have changed by now, but there's 23 candidates for the Democratic Party. Uh, Biden is obviously the, the ruling class's choice. There's all these articles saying that he, he's running away with it and he's already he's got this in the bag and blah, blah, blah. Um, but a lot can happen between now and November 2020, as we saw in 2016. And we've seen, though, that despite his capitulation in 2016, Sanders remains enormously popular. Um, I think maybe a lot of the more radical people that had some illusions to him at that time have, have, have shifted a, a, away from that. But there's still millions of people who would like him to be the Democratic Party candidate, not just to beat Trump, but also because they think he could bring some fundamental improvement to their lives. Um, he's raised more money than anybody from more people than anybody, although now that, that might change with, with Biden because the money's going to come in <clears throat> from the ruling class. He's a safe pair of hands. Uh, Joe Biden, he was the, the vice president under Obama, which is seen like a kind of golden age, even though it was just you know, three years ago, um, uh, now that we have Trump. And, and a, lot of, a lot of Americans who are pragmatic, including Sanders himself, will likely go along with Biden if they think that that's what's going to be, beat Trump. Um, although the bourgeois are also maybe putting a little bit of a bet on Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris or, or, uh, or Buttigieg or whatever uh, as backups to, to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to stave off Sanders. Um, but, but because the problem with Sanders isn't so much what he says he'll do. He was loyal in 2016. He'll be loyal as a dog this time. He'll be super loyal. I mean, I think there's no question about it. But it's the people behind him that, 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 that they're worried about. Uh, the, the people that got riled up in 2016, they, they don't want that to happen because if he were to come to power on the basis of events, if there's a crisis, if the economy crashes in the next period, and it will at some point, he could be forced to go further to the left than he intends, and that could unleash uh, all these forces. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we're still over you know, a year and a half away, so we're not trying to predict what's gonna happen. Next year, we'll have a US Perspectives discussion uh, in a year, so we'll be able to have a little clearer idea of what's gonna be happening. But, but we, what we do know is that there's millions of people who are already done with the two-party system. There's hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people that are 
open to socialism and even to revolutionary socialism. And there's a lot of people that are in favor of a mass party. And eventually, that's a third party, as we call it, a third party that can become the first party. I don't have time to go into all the numbers, but here, here's one. Only one in 10 adults, one in 10 adults agree that the two-party system works fairly well. I mean, that, you know, I mean a, a majority of Democrats want a new party, i.e. a majority of the people that will probably vote for a Democrat to beat Trump would rather vote for something else. And a lot of Republicans are probably in, in the same boat. So, so, you know, it's very unlikely that a new force is going to arise in the next period that's going to beat the two parties in 2020. Um, it's not totally ruled out, but, but uh, that's unlikely. It's likely that a lot of people are going to vote for the Democrats. But we also can't rule out a Trump victory. You know, never say never. History knows all kinds of strange and, and surprising transformations. Uh, the Democrats are experts at, 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 at you know, losing uh, when they're supposed to win. <laughs> And you know, if the crisis comes, they might not want to take that. that. They might let, want to let him handle the crisis another four years and, and destroy the Republican Party. Uh, because you know, if he does lose, the civil war in the Republican Party, is, it's only been held together very you know, fragilely by the glue of the popularity of Trump. And once he's out of office, whether it's in a, in a year or two or, or in six or whenever it is, uh, the, the, you'll see big, big problems in the Republicans. Now, we're all aware, I think, of the big pressures that are going to be honest to bend to opportunism, to bend to lesser evilism. Um, and we, but we know, I think all of us were clear what the Democratic Party represents, why we don't support it, why we can't support it in any way, shape, or storm. We weathered a lot of pressure in 2016. A lot of other groups didn't. A lot of the crisis that we've seen in groups like the CWI or the ISO, uh, th that, that comes down to the fact that they, they bent to that pressure and uh, they abandoned the class line and now the CWI is openly supporting Sanders as a Democrat, supporting a bourgeois party of austerity and imperialism, et cetera. It's, it's really incredible. But we should also be aware of the danger of sectarianism. With so many people you know, moving towards reformism, which is the natural first stage of political awareness, you try to reform what exists instead of trying to chuck it all out. Um, uh, there's some people that are going to bend the stick, as we've seen, uh, in the opposite direction, in an ultra-left direction. And there's a reason why we, we've, we've got this uh, discussion going on about Marxism and ultra-leftism and sectarianism, and all everybody should be sure to read and discuss that uh, bulletin in the next period. Because it's a real fine line sometimes, it's real art that requires a lot of nuance, a lot of tact to connect with people on common points of agreement uh, without ourselves crossing that principled class line, uh, maintaining the need for class independence and so on, as opposed to simply denouncing people as, as idiots for having illusions in, 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 you know, in bourgeois parties or whatever, or even giving the impression that, oh, we're holier than thou, I'm holier than thou, I know more than you, you'll learn when you grow up that the Democrat, you know, I mean, it's easy to get a little, a little smarmy even about it. So we should be careful because even small ways, ultra leftism can, can turn people can turn people off. Uh, you know, as Marx said, bold in matter and mild in manner is is the best way to win people. <clears throat> but of course, we have to remember that the big story of the last few years is the rise of interest in socialism, and more and more people have a more and more radical definition of what socialism means. Um, but most people only became socialists in the last few months or the last couple years. Uh, you know, like a lot of our own comrades. I mean, how many comrades? <clears throat> how many comrades here were Marxist revolutionary socialists when Trump was elected in 2016? How many weren't? How many weren't, rather, when Trump was elected? Uh, you know, a good third of our membership has had to go through that experience, go through that process, and that's completely normal and natural. And keep that in mind, that that's where a lot of these other people are coming from. But people can learn, as, as, as we've learned, they can learn from experience, they can learn from studying, and, uh, and, and that, that's our task in the next period. Um, there's a danger, of course, that the reformists in Congress and the people that call themselves socialists, AOC and people, or, or Jacobin, that they can give a, a, a bad, uh, leave a bad taste in people's mouth about what socialism is. You know, we always say that uh, betrayal is, re is inherent in reformism, but so is failure. You know, and, and that's not very exciting. And if these people are failing all the time and say, no, we're socialists and we can't get anything done, that can have an effect, which is why we need to have a, a sense of urgency when it comes to getting out there and differentiating ourselves patiently as revolutionary socialists and winning all these new socialists to a revolutionary vision of what that means. Um, you know, around the world, everywhere we look, it's the same basic process that's taking place, this transformation of, of, of consciousness. And, and over time, quantitative accumulations turn into qualitative changes in consciousness. But we also understand that the revolutionary party, in the form of quality, 
can also become mass quantity at a certain stage. And it's a very complicated world we're, bu we're building in. I mean, it's very chaotic what's going on in Britain, but frankly, it's, it's, it, the lines are pretty clear. Uh, you know, the day-to-day -day changes uh, are, are, you know, the, the, it's hard to predict exactly what's going on, but you got the Labour Party, you got the Tory Party, uh, you know, obviously Brexit throws a wrench into things and stuff, but here it, it, it's really even messier and more complicated, so we really have to keep our, our magnetic north uh, of Marxist theory. Um, and, uh, you know, and we got to also keep ourselves optimistic and revolutionary, uh, you know, have our revolutionary optimism up and, up and high. This, this system is trying to drag us down. This system is trying to make it impossible. I mean, not consciously, it's not like a, you know, conscious, you know, Borg that's trying to do this to us, but the system, uh, the dynamics of it try to drag us into situations where we can't do revolutionary work effectively. It's, uh, we have the opioid crisis, methamphetamines, the anti-anxiety drug crisis. We have rising depression and alienation and anxiety, suicide. Birth rates are falling in this country because people don't want to bring kids into this world or they just simply can't afford it. Uh, it's, I found this incredible. 31% of Americans think another civil war is likely in the next period. And I don't think they have in mind a revolutionary liberation of, of, of the working class kind of a civil war, but a sort of a chaos... Uh, apocalypse kind of a thing. I mean, p p people are worried about the future, and we have to inject, uh, you know, uh, you know, inject our revolutionary optimism and ideas into these movements. For decades, individuals have been trying to find a solution to their problems. They're slowly coming to the conclusion that only collective solutions are going to get them out of this. And we don't know where the next movement's going to come. Is it going to be a crash in the economy? Is it going to be a war? Is it going to be a weather disaster? The elections, uh, another mass shooting, the immigration crisis or whatever, or international events, you know, as the Arab Spring inspired things in Wisconsin, for example. Um, but, uh, but at some point, something bigger, all these different movements are going to come together and they're going to start coalescing into something with a more clear class, uh, class understanding of the world. The question of climate change is high on young people's minds in particular, uh, and it's catalyzing a questioning of the system as a whole. There's more carbon dioxide in the, in, the, in the world now than there has been since Homo sapiens emerged on the planet. I mean, so we're talking about uh, an existential crisis for our species. And of course, the attack on abortion rights, which has been ramped up uh, dramatically in the last couple of weeks, is uh, could very quickly, the defense of that, could very quickly move beyond basic democratic rights to a question of the system as a whole. And young people are far from apathetic. I mean, look at all the comrades we have here today, but most of them just aren't inspired. They aren't inspired by what they see. We have the most inspired and inspiring words, uh, ideas and words. We have the most inspiring ideas in the world, and we have to bring these ideas to young people in particular. We have to win them to our organization, and we have to have a sense of urgency. The ruling class doesn't have a lot of time, but neither do we. Uh, and so while we connect with movements as they arise, we have to always remember we are Bolshevik revolutionaries working within those movements. We are not activists who happen to, on the side, have a Marxist reading group. We have to differentiate ourselves through our ideas, through our working class methods, through our working class orientation, uh, not merely by being the most morally outraged uh, people in the room. Uh, you know, that, 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 you know, we are outraged by capitalism, but we take a scientific, methodical approach to understanding it, to taking it apart, and we understand that though it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of years, it can be done, and that's what gives us our confidence. So comrades, we're still assembling the first core of, of cadre. We're still a relatively small group. We're still mainly in a propaganda phase in the sense that we're, we're, we're educating people in lots of ideas, in theory and history and things like that. People need a lot of ideas. They need a lot of explanation. We have to explain the Soviet Union. We have to explain all kinds of stuff uh, for us to win them. People need more explanation than ever. I think uh, young people, they're more critical than ever. They're more cynical in many ways than ever. And we are, are you know, we're the only ones that can offer uh, the clarity that can, that can break that cynicism, which I think probably, how many of you were, were kind of cynical before you discovered revolutionary Marxism? I mean, I mean, pretty much got a couple hand waves. One person who wasn't was, has always been a revolutionary uh, <laughs> from birth. Um, uh, so, so, you know, we, we, we just got to keep that in mind, you know, it, it, it's not always easy to, to win people. Um, we'll talk later this afternoon about how we build the organization, but every little step of that process matters. And agitational slogans that we come up with sometimes, they are important, they have a place in our work, but most people aren't going to be won 
by just one issue of the paper or one agitational slogan. We have to combine all of that. But we also can't get used to being a relatively small group, to being in a relatively propagandistic phase. As conditions and consciousness change, we're going to have to be able to intervene energetically, flexibly, and, and summarize big ideas into a few key slogans that can mobilize people, not just in action on the streets and in the workplace and, and so on, but also into joining our organization. How many of you uh, saw the Game of Thrones finale? Okay, the, lu the lucky other majority of you don't, don't, won't know what I'm saying, but, but I mean, from the Game of Thrones finale to this book, Sapiens, by Yuval Harari, if you've heard of this book, the bourgeois, they're really pushing this idea that the liberals and their apologists, they're, they're really pushing the idea that ideas and myths and stories, such as religion, the idea of capitalism, the idea of politics, that these, these, these are the most powerful forces that shape human thinking. Now, this is obviously a blatantly idealist approach to history. Uh, and although ideas are a powerful force in history, the working class is more worried about jobs and healthcare and housing and debt, not shared narratives and myths, which is what, what allegedly makes the worlds go round. And shared narratives and myths are not gonna stop the revolution from happening. But what will stop the revolution from being successful is if the working class doesn't have the leadership it needs. Now, Trump declared that the United States will never be a socialist country. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was nodding smugly, and everyone was clapping about that. Uh, and, and as comrades said in, in, uh, on, on social media, we accept the challenge. You know, the IMT accepts the challenge. We're fighting for socialism in our lifetime because humanity, frankly, can't afford anything less. Thank you, comrades.